And what kind of world do I want to live in? I want to live in a world where we educate our children properly. To draw out the potential from inside them and show them how magic they are, how magical they can be. Not train them to sit in lines and learn how to do tests. That's the kind of world I'd like to be a part of. I'm an educational reformist. I'm an educational radical. I fundamentally disagree with most of the educational system that I work within. I don't think it empowers people. I don't think it educates people very well. I think it perpetuates fear, fear of failure, fear of testing. It doesn't have very much to do with love at all. And it's all about ticking the boxes, getting the grades, passing the things to be validated as a person. That's rubbish. And I am part of that. And I do my best to do something useful within that, shine a light within that. What kind of world would I like to live in? I'd like to live in a world where our education system was genuinely inspiring, passionate, forward-thinking, magical. That's the kind of world I'd like to live in. Home. All meditation technique is about using breath so that you can empty your mind. This idea that we need to make our minds up and remember loads of stuff is complete nonsense. All the, all the information we could possibly need is out there in the morphogenetic field, the collective consciousness. If we're open, it comes towards us. It's good if you keep open rather than deciding and then whatever you need will come towards you keep your mind like a parachute it works best open Eckhart Tolle's theory about the pain body is quite complex in some ways and the simple version is that something that we all understand on a basic level. If you were abused when you were a child, the chances of you replaying that in some way in your life is quite high. Eckhart Tolle's theory about this is that you have a consciousness that is formed through what happens to you in life. A bit like Candida, when Candida is in your body, it tells your brain that you want sugar and wheat and fermented stuff and the things it wants to eat. It's a, a microscopic parasite, but it's smart enough to override your brain and tell your brain what it wants. Well, the pain body's a little bit like that. If you've experienced violence and abuse in your life, then there is a part of you that is going to seek out more of that because that's what it feeds off, that's what makes it what it is. And it's a very strong force to overcome. You can look at that on an energetic level, on a spirit level, on an entity level, on a parasite level, on a psychological level, counselling level, it doesn't really matter what you believe about it. I think most people would see that there is something about us that replays experiences and feeds off it and I do think what Eckhart Tolle says about the way that we watch horror films and violence and the news being so full of aggression and violence that's not a conscious useful way of living to fill our heads with that to fill ourselves with that so I'm not saying that we should all be playing with natural logs and smelling the flowers and sitting in the fields ignoring modern day technology or what we've created, I'm not saying that. And I do think there is something about being conscious and awake in the now that needs to acknowledge that there's a part of us that isn't awake. 
just what Eckhart Tolle calls the pain body. It's not quite the same as ego or other descriptions and it is like an entity that wants feeding and it wants more of the same and it's not helpful on the planet. Are we feeding the insanity of mind and the planet by watching violence on the news, TV or movies? Who is watching the violence? The pain body. Who is financing all these violent films? Pain bodies. Who makes these violent films? Pain bodies. Make them? Pain bodies watch them. Pain bodies love them. Pain bodies pay to watch them. <laughs> but now we have a whole industry designed to feed pain bodies. Why else would anybody watch violence on a screen? And news, of course. News is also mentioned in the question. There are a few people in a few offices around big cities and they choose what they give you, feed you as news. They choose, say, this matters, this is important, we are going to feed them this and that and that. And they, what they choose is an expression of their state of consciousness. <laughs> and often the pain body is an important part of their state of consciousness. So what you watch is not the, actually the world news, it's what a few people who embody a particular state of consciousness, and usually it's not the new one, ch choose as significant. Diverse similarity, or similar diversity, seems to be the phrase that's coming out of all of this work for me. All these people have got very different blends or brands of what they say and how they say it but it does feel like there's a commonality amongst these messages and that's the one that I want to pull out. Common sense wisdom, that feels like what we need on the planet. Osho was saying that religions are, are made for naive people, for childish people. They're really oversimplified. I don't mean that in a heretical way or a blasphemous way to take away from anybody's beliefs. That's not what I mean. I don't think Osho does either. I think there's a big difference between an institutionalised set of beliefs that becomes a set of rules that becomes a little bit lowest common denominator that is not the most useful way of looking at things. Many wars, many people's lives have been uh, taken from people's beliefs. So I'm, I'm not really interested in what I believe in anymore. I'm interested in... Positive thinking sounds such a rubbish way of describing it. And I think looking for the similarities and agreements rather than the disagreements is just useful. It's just common sense. It's diverse similarity. Somebody told me that the only devils running around are the ones that are in our own hearts. Do you think that that's true? There are no devils. With the gods, all devils disappear. They were shadows of your God. Without God, the devil cannot exist. You will be surprised to know that the word devil and the word divine have the same root. They come from the same root. It is a Sanskrit root. In Sanskrit, divine is called deva. From Deva comes the English word divine and the devil. In fact, the devil and God are two sides of the same coin. There is neither God 
nor devil. Your religions are not for mature people. They are childish. So, I'm not really expecting that anybody watching this isn't already on a similar song sheet to the way that I'm thinking. Yeah, I guess I'm a, a weirdy, hippie, new age, lefty, liberalist, utopian idealist, really. I guess that's what it comes down to, with a bit of punk rock thrown in there. Positioning myself within the speakers that I have in this video, I feel like I'm in the centre. I know that Zizek's very left, and the Occupy movement seems very left of centre. But maybe that whole paradigm needs a, a rethink, or a rework, or maybe it just needs dissolving and... Like Zizek says, you know, what kind of leaders do we want? What kind of system do we want to replace the one that doesn't work so well for everybody? That's a difficult question. I'm not claiming to have the answers here. I'm claiming to have some questions here though, and my question is, why don't people join the dots between all these amazing thinkers on the planet? Why doesn't Zizek talk to Eckhart Tolle? Why doesn't Gangaji meet with Avital talking about Derrida? You know, these, all these great thinkers, great speakers, don't seem to know about each other. So if I had one wish to come out of this project, it would be that maybe some kind of conference was called, or maybe some kind of discussion table was created, where some of these amazing thinkers could join the dots. So it's absolutely simple what I have to say to you. It's what my teacher said to me. And I'm still um, deeply discovering the reverberation of that. And it's simply stop looking for what you want. Not cynically stop looking for what you want. Because there's a way of stopping looking for what you want in resignation and cynicism and closing down. But innocently, openly, stop looking for what you want in this moment. Not tomorrow when you have it. But in this moment, to take one moment, whatever it is you want, however mundane or profound, and just stop looking for it. And you will find more than what you could ever want. Because more than what can be wanted is already who you are. It's too simple to be grasped. But absolutely, completely realizable. If, and it is a huge if of course, you are willing to give up your hope that what you want will be found in the next thought or the next activity or the next day or the next man or the next woman or the next teaching or the next experience. So that's huge. That's the challenge. Put your hand on your heart. Put your hand on your heart. And just ask yourself internally. And just ask yourself internally. What kind of world do I want to live in? What kind of world do I want to live in? And listen. And listen. Do it now. Do it now. I'm placing myself in the middle of this project to look at who am I in relation to my beliefs and my actions and how they fit into the voices of people that I really listen to in my life. How do I make sense of that? How do I make sense of being me?
I don't know makes sense if making sense means anything of being somebody who cares passionately about the world who doesn't want to go on a protest. That doesn't make any sense. As I let go of understanding and step into trust, trust that my intention to shine a light is enough, enough for something bigger than the sum of its parts will emerge from this. And that thing will be a very useful thing that came out of nothing, nothing. I mean, look, the internet's full of nothing. There's no, nothing there. It's a virtual world. It's ones and zeros. So when nothing becomes something, then that's interesting. That's what Ramtha's talking about. Your thoughts matter, literally. I don't really know what I think about Ramtha. I don't really know. I don't really know what I think about that whole phenomena. But I listen to her words, his words, and they resonate with me. So that's all I can go off at the moment. One evening, or one fine morning, you wake up and understand and come to an extraordinary illumination. And that extraordinary illumination is this, that what you think matters, what you think matters, literally, don't have to have some divination of the statement. It literally is. And that if what you think matters, then it becomes important as to what you hear and see and think about what you hear and see. Because what you think about what you hear and see also matters. And the purpose is, of course, that must be something more than just becoming aware of the internal picture, that the internal picture, as it were, is an actionable concept that we're entertaining. And that if we entertain, we make the pictures actionable. And what is actionable consciousness? Materiality. It is materiality in the form of personal reality. What is personal reality? Everything that manifests in our life, our environment that is indeed unique to each of you. It doesn't have to be like everyone else. It's your journey, it's unique to you. So this project, entitled Fear and Love, felt like it wanted a conclusion and I have one actually uh, yeah my friend Susie Blomfield died whilst I was making this project and the moment that I was told that she died I realized that I had never said in the way that I would have liked to have said thank you for all your words of encouragement so this piece is now dedicated to Susie Blomfield and for the gift that she gave me in passing away to remind me it's important to tell the people that I love, I love you, to thank the people that have supported me, appreciated me and loved me, thank you. I mean look we don't get to take any of this with us when we go, I'm not getting to take any of this with me when I go. All these things that matter so much to us, our differences, the things we fight for and argue about, you don't get to take them with you when you go. So, in leaving us early, Susie Blomfield has given me a great gift to remind me to not fixate on the things that are uh, temporary, material. And I'm not saying it's not important, to look into the detail of things. Our thoughts matter, literally. And what matters to me right now is to appreciate being alive and coming from love and light. So Susie Blomfield, thank you for that great gift you've given me to remind me to be appreciative. Bless you.
What kind of world do I want to live in?